almost fail. Well, because we have problems. We had the problems at Rendezvous. We had the problems at the Kokur, our primary target, where we made three bomb runs because we were ordered uh, to drop the car, the uh, bomb by Orton bomb site. <laughs> yeah. And wh why do you have to have 13 people on board? Is well, we had extra people because two of them, one, uh, they were weaponeers that were in charge of the bomb. One fell up before we went up to altitude. He was uh, a Navy man, Commander Ashworth, went back into the front bay and, and he changed uh, three plugs. And he changed it from, uh, from red to green. And that activated the firing circuits on the bomb. But we took off with, with the bomb partially armed. And if anything would have happened to us on, on Tinian when we took off, we would have wiped the whole island off the face of the earth. And of course, nobody wanted that. But that's the way this bomb was, was put together, that it had to be partially armed before we took off, and then the rest was done up in the air before we went up to our bombing altitude of 30,000 feet. So uh, it was just one of those things that uh, was inherent with the bomb itself. Our bomb, the Fat Man bomb, was about four times stronger than the one that was dropped in Hiroshima. and. Uh, and if you see some pictures of, of, of uh, Nagasaki now, it's got mountains on one side. See, the bomb was desi designed for for just a flat city with no no interruptions as far as as uh, mountains or anything else are concerned. And uh, that's why we made three bomb runs over Kokura in hopes of dropping the bomb there. But when we couldn't do it and the bombardier couldn't see his, his aiming point, we had to go to Nagasaki. And uh, Nagasaki had been hit before. Why it was on the, on the target list, I don't know. Because it had mountains on one side. And of course we ended up dropping the bomb on Nagasaki. And then we saw pictures afterwards at the base of the mountains. Some of the villages there were intact. They weren't uh, damaged at all like, like the rest of the city was. And uh, that well, again was due to the fact that the mountains were there restricting the blast effect. Even though our bomb was was stronger than uh, the Hiroshima bomb. How did you get away from the target? Yeah. Okay. Did you turn or what? And did, and did the plane rock or not? Yeah. When uh, this was, was uh, figured out by the, the scientists, we had two aircraft with it. We were supposed to meet with three over the rendezvous point of, of Yakushima at the southern end of, of uh, Japan. Uh, we got it's a six hour flight from Tinian to Yakushima. Is the line off the, the southern tip of Japan, and we got there first. It was a, uh, it was clear. I mean, it was no clouds in the sky or anything. And about five or six minutes later, we were met by Captain Bach, who carried the instrumentation that was to be dropped at the same time our, the atomic bomb was dropped. So, and it was on parachutes, so it stayed in the air longer, of course. And, and the scientists can get a reading on how the bomb was working that way. So uh, we waited, we had orders to wait 15 minutes for the, the other ship we were waiting for was a photographic airship. And we were waiting for it because the two of us were on station already. And uh, we were supposed to wait 15 minutes only. So we waited the first 15 minutes and my pilot Sweeney for some reason decided to wait a second 15 minutes and a third 15 minutes, which was against orders. And by this time we were up at 30,000 feet pulling all this power and using all this gas. And uh, that was the first time we got put in a hole right away because we intended to just go bang from from our rendezvous point to the primary target of Kokura, drop the bomb, and then go back to Tinian. How was it, Kokura? That was our primary target. That was a military installation? Yeah, it was a military installation. It was a military headquarters. And of course, when they had their own little individual shops, you know, like the Japanese were were prone to do to uh, support their war effort. And uh, so any city that you hit over there was, was a target, but they had uh, a big headquarters for the army there. And uh, they picked it out. And I was surprised when I found out that uh, they did pick Nagasaki. It's a seaport city. And to me, it, was, uh, it wasn't a, a pristine target as far as uh, the city not being bombed before was was concerned, but they picked it because I guess it was big enough and it was a an industrial center for 
for the war effort, and that's the reason they picked it. So would more damage have been inflicted if you had the original target? Yes, because it was a flat city, uh -huh. but never been bombed before. At the briefings, and this was throughout the 20th uh, Air Force Command, there were the cities that they didn't want any target of opportunity. They didn't want that, want you to, to just bomb any target if you couldn't bomb your primary. But they they made it a point to not bomb these Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and and uh, uh, Kokura. So the Kokura was a, a flat plane, and, and some of the destructive power of the bomb depended on, on the heat, high heat was generated by the bomb, and the blast effect. Mm -hmm. So when we got over uh, Nagasaki, we uh, we had to make it a radar run because uh, we were running low on gasoline in the cloud coverage because of our delay over Kokura and our, our rendezvous point. We were over Kokura for 50 minutes and we took three different bomb runs in hopes of being able to see the aiming point, be hand up in the nose. We get to the end of the bomb and he says, no drop, can't see it. So again, we took another attack and tried to find another direction. Didn't work. So finally Sweeney thought, well, we better go on to our secondary target. Now, I was a second lieutenant then and I made a tour of the aircraft. You know, we checked it out before uh, we took off. That was, we always did that. And Sweeney and, and our uh, our flight engineer, Kuhark, they were together and they were making their own little check. Well, we discovered at that time, I didn't know about this until I was up over Kokura, after we had made the three bomb runs over Kokura. And uh, they discovered that our, our uh, we had 640 gallons in the rear bomb bay, that our booster pump to remove the gasoline from from the rear bomb bay up to the up to the wing tanks into the engines was malfunctioning. Well, Sweeney immediately went to see Colonel, uh, Colonel Tibbetts and told him what the problem was. And uh, Tibbetts, just for a few seconds, said, well, don't worry about it because that gasoline back there is, is for your your weight and balance for the for the 10,000 pound fat man in the front bomb bay. Well, Sweeney bought it and he says, well, okay, we'll go ahead and take it off. Well, that was a big mistake too, because it had put us in a big hole too. This was before we took off. I didn't know about it because they didn't tell me. I was only a second lieutenant. I was doing my job, but that's all. So I didn't know about it until we got over Kokura. We made the three bomb runs, and then all of a sudden there was a flurry in the, in the cockpit, and uh, I could see the uh, engineer working out the, the slipstick, you know, see what our, our consumption was and what we had left. And then he reported to Sweeney, he says, we had enough gasoline, hopefully, to get from from Kokura to Nagasaki and then go into Okinawa as our emergency landing uh, field. And we were just keeping our fingers crossed all the time. So uh, that's what we did. Now, when we got over the target for Koku for Nagasaki, uh, we were going to drop it, supposedly, by uh, the Norden bomb site. But because of our delay over the rendezvous and over our, our primary target, uh, that threw everything back. And when we got to Nagasaki, uh, it was about nine tenths cloud coverage. But we had no choice. We couldn't gin around like we did over Kokura, looking for a hole. We had to decide. So Sweeney decided that we dropped the bomb by radar, which was against orders. And to this day, I wonder if we would have gone that route, what they would have done to us when we got back to Tinian. So uh, as a result of that, we uh, uh, started our, our bomb run to uh, Nagasaki. When we got there, we just started our, our bomb run immediately. And like Paul knows, the, the radar run is the navigators up in the front of the nose and we got a, with a scope and then in the back there's a radar operator and they both have scopes and they're coordinating the run to make sure that they got the right target on that scope and the bombardiers involved naturally. So we were about 95% completed on the radar run. Went up in the nose, Captain Behan hollered, I see it, I see it, I've got it. So when he said that, of course, the bomb run was relinquished to him and uh, he took over and he had 45 seconds to set up the bomb site, kill the drift, and make sure that, that uh, we were on, on the right course. 
And if it wasn't for him, he's the one that saved us from finding out exactly what would have happened to us if we didn't drop by uh, visual sight, but by radar. So when he dropped it, our immediate maneuver was to make a 60 degree bank to the left and go 155 degrees in the opposite direction. Now we were at 30,000 feet and the scientists had decided that if we would have gone in a straight line, the bomb falling on a trajectory like that, we would have been over the point of explosion. Mm -hmm. And they were afraid that we'd have structural damage to the aircraft, even over 30,000 feet. There was such a, a, a bang about it. Well, I remember we were in a turn and I had my special glasses on. They are like welder's glasses. Mm -hmm. they had, uh, if Tibbets didn't like what he uh, uh, what he did, what they did to his site, and he took them off, and he he dropped the Hiroshima bomb without it, even though they had the same uh, dangerous effect of of blinding you when the, when the bomb went off. But anyway, we were in a turn, and all of a sudden, this this bright bluish light filled the the entire cockpit, and then we knew that the bomb was viable. So we just continued on around and. Of course, we always wanted to look down and see what was happening, and then over the entire city, we could see this this smoke, dust, and fire breaking out all over the area. And out of the center of the uh, of the city came this telltale mushroom cloud. The mushroom cloud came up to our altitude in a matter of about a minute and a half. We were at 30,000 feet. It continued on up to about 50 or 60,000. And when it came past us, this was like a boiling cauldron of oil, you know. Uh, there were all kinds of colors, colors I'd never seen before. But the one predominant color was salmon pink, and to this day I'll remember that color. And uh, then, of course, we went on around, and, and Sweeney wanted to go back and take another look at it. Why, I don't know, because our gas situation was critical. We went back, and we were all concentrating on looking down again when uh, somebody from the back hollered, the mushroom cloud is coming toward us. And of course, the scientists had told us to stay out of the mushroom cloud because of the radioactivity. We could have been poisoned. And if we had gone through it, we wouldn't die instantly. But somewhere down the line, we'd, we'd die from radiation poisoning. So of course, to get out of harm's way, so he took the aircraft and dove it down to the right, full throttles. And I remember looking out the window, and uh, for a while, I couldn't tell whether the cloud was gaining on us or we were gaining on a cloud, but finally we did pull away because otherwise they wouldn't be here telling the story. And uh, we wasted no time getting to Okinawa. The, the, the top was starting to come out. It was pretty well formed because we could see it coming up to us. It, you, first you saw the little top of the mushroom and then it expanded and expanded. And by the time it got up to our altitude, the bottom of the stem of the mushroom was where the churning was going on. Mm -hmm. And then the colors were there also. And then the, the top of the mushroom just kept expanding. And it went up to 50 or 60,000 feet. And that's where it stayed for a long time before it dissipated. So uh, when it went past us, of course, we all looked at it. And it, to me, uh, it was something that I'll, I'll never forget, especially the, the, uh, that salmon pink. But anyway, when we dropped them up, we were hit by th three shock blasts maybe about a minute or a minute and a half after we dropped the bomb. And uh, the scientists had warned us about this. And there was nothing that the scientists left out. The one thing that bothered us, and we, we talked about it later among the crewmen, they say, well, we think this would happen. We think this will happen. But they weren't sure, of course, being the first two experimental bombs that we had. You know, you had to understand that <laughs> there could have been some glitches in the whole thing that, that uh, could have caused a problem. We had these other two guys on board. Well, one guy is a radar operator. He's Beezer from, from Baltimore. His job was to jam the Japanese radar because if they happened to hit the right frequencies and, and they were the same as the one that the bomb had, we could have exploded. Oh. Just, you know, of course, we would have been vaporized and wouldn't have found anything of us, but luckily that didn't happen. He's the only crew member that went on both the Hiroshima mission and the Nagasaki mission that did the same job. How'd you get picked? I asked Tibbets one time, I says, Paul, I says, people ask me how I got picked. 
I got my wings in, in August 4th, 1944. And, uh, you know, that's kind of late. And he said, well, we wanted certain criteria in the people that were picked to become part of the 509, 393rd. He said they had to be a good pilot. They had to have certain characteristics uh, as far as, as their character and their demeanor. And so you're not the kind of a guy that, that you get in the jam that you're going to get all flustered like that. Uh, <laughs> and he said, evidently you filled the bill, so you were sent to us. So you had some practice missions. Oh yeah, before we, we actually did the actual dropping of the atomic bombs, we had these individual cities that we bombed. How long did you go on? Four. And you dropped one bomb each time? One bomb each time. And were they damaging? Uh, oh yeah, targets? yeah, yeah. They were, again, they were stronger than TNT, so there were uh, 10,000 10, pounds of, of that huh. packed in the, in the casing of the Fat Man bomb. Colonel Lee. Yes, sir. What in general was the psychological, forgetting yourself for a moment, feeling of the crew after the mission that they talked to, they had regrets, were they happy? No. Uh, what was the general feeling? Both crews, to a man, knew that uh, they, when they dropped the bomb, they were hoping that the war was going to end. After we, the first one was dropped in Hiroshima, they hoped that would have been enough with the, with the devastation that, that uh, it occurred with, you know. And uh, we waited, uh, what, three days, and they didn't surrender. And we had to go on the 9th because we were going to lose the weather, and, and Tibbets didn't want to do it at the time. He wanted to drop the second one. Also let the Japanese know that we had another atomic bomb, and it just wasn't a fluke, you know, that we just had one bomb. But uh, to a man, nobody felt that, that uh, it was wrong to drop the, the bombs on, on Japan because they knew it should end the war and it saved American lives. Because again, on November 1st of 1945, we were going to invade the Japanese Empire, and it would have been a bigger invasion than what we had on June 6, 1944 for Europe, because everybody was going to go over there. And uh, it would have been a bloodbath because they had women and children trained that the minute the invasion started, they went to their assigned places on the beach and they would poison the, the GIs, do whatever they could to, to keep them from, from putting their, their feet on, on the sacred soil of Japan. Well, it saved a lot of Japanese lives too. To oh, sure, and that doesn't even, you know. You can imagine if the landing would have been successful, and this would have been the time the, the invasion fleet would have been most vulnerable when they're making the invasion because they're all grouped together. If they could, if they would have uh, been able to repulse the, uh, not repulse, I should say, the invasion, and they got into the to the uh, Japanese land proper, uh, we'd have to fight the whole population because they believed that if you died for the emperor, you went to heaven. So it just was uh, something that uh, didn't occur, which we were glad for because it saved American lives, you know. Well, I, the one thing that struck me, or that came into my mind before, just before the bomb was dropped, that I thought we were going to kill a lot of women and children and, and elderly people. But it just came into my mind for a second and I just forgot it. Because you can't dwell on something like that when you've got a job to do, you know. So, uh, but then after that I just never thought about it. Because people say, well, do you often think about it? No, I don't often think about it. I mean, somebody will say something about... Uh, uh, how do you feel about the mission? And I just tell them, well, it saved American lives, and that's the bottom line, you yeah. know. And to me, it was worth it. To this day, Glenn, we are not recognized by our government. They have never asked us to go and visit with the, with the president. And I can understand, because it's a hot topic to this day. Some people are against dropping the bomb, and some people are for it. Yeah. So even 52 years after the end of the, the war, dropping the bomb, we've never been invited to the White House. You They've had everybody go, ball everybody. players and basketball players and whatever. But everything that I've said tonight, I've been saying since 1947, yeah. and I've never changed the story. 